Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Very sincere welcome to the Institute of International Affairs here in Dublin. Great to see, how are you? Great to see some old friends and some new ones as well. Uh, very happy to welcome you to this uh, event here on the topic of AI. We have two brilliant uh, discussants. I think we've, uh, we've agreed to stick with first names, which is great. Uh, I'm going to just quickly introduce the event. Um, so we know AI is poised to usher in significant changes in the global economy, trade and education, government, employment, health, arts and culture and everything in between. Indeed, it has already ushered in many changes. And as part of the ongoing discussion on the AI revolution, as it's been dubbed, France will host the AI Action Summit on the 10th and 11th of February next year. So that's not the only reason why we're, we're here, but it's just an important bit of background. And I'm sure our uh, um, Henri Verger, our first speaker, Ambassador for Digital Affairs at the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs, may comment upon. We're also joined, uh, Henri will be in discussion with Dr. Patricia Scanlon, Ireland's first and, in my view, best AI ambassador, and indeed founder of Soapbox Labs. Um, the panelists will, uh, will facilitate a discussion between the three of us for about 20 minutes or so, and then this will give an opportunity for the crowd here in Dublin and these those joining online to chip in with their questions as well. The conventional caveats, if you want to ask a question here when you're in the room, just raise your hand and a mic will come to you. Online, if you ask a question, just use the Q&A function on Zoom. Just to remind everyone, as is keeping with our convention, the discussion today is on the record. And I'm just merely going to do a little quid of due diligence, a bit of due diligence by introducing our speakers, uh, short biographies, and then we'll get straight down into the discussion. So Henri Verdier is Ambassador for Digital Affairs at the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Henri has led the uh, digital diplomacy in France since 2018. Henri is co-founder and CEO of MFG Labs, an internet-based startup involved in social data mining, and he's chairman of the board of Cap Digital, the French European cluster for digital content and services. Ambassador Verdier has co-authored three books written in French, L'Age de Multitude, Entrepreneur et Gouvernement après la Révolution Numérique, The Age of Multitude, Entrepreneurship and Governance after the Digital Revolution in 2017, and The Startup d'État à l'État platform. From, uh, that's from state startups to the platform state and Le Business de la Haine, Internet, La Démocratie et les réseaux sociaux, The Business of Hate, Internet Democracy and Social Networks. So, uh, a real smorgasbord of themes and topics there, but a really excellent speaker to have with us here in person. We're delighted to welcome you. Dr. Patricia Scanlon is known to many of us here, certainly the Institute, but also in Irish society more widely. Patricia is Ireland's AI ambassador, a role which she has held since 2022. And uh, you're also chair of Ireland's AI advisory council. In 2013, Patricia founded Soapbox Labs, a pioneering company specialing in ethical voice AI technology for ch children, with application across education and gaming. Soapbox Labs became a global leader and was acquired by US-based Curriculum Associates in 2023. Her innovative contribution to the tech industry earned her recognition by Forbes as one of the world's top 50 women in tech in 2018. So really pleased to have you both here. I'm just gonna start with a very general discussion and I'll go to you first, Henri. Many initiatives dedicated to AI governance have been launched over the last couple of years by the UN, by the EU, indeed by national governments and indeed by private actors. What's your assessment of these initiatives and who is doing it well? You might start by just telling us a little bit about the summit that you're uh, helping to lead in France next February. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be there with you. So I started my journey this morning, but it's a pleasure to exchange about those important topics in a country of deep culture. <laughs> and that's a real pleasure. Um, so very brief in a nutshell, uh, we are leading a paradigm shift, uh, at minimum as important as the internet revolution itself, maybe more. Uh, everything will change, we know this, uh, science, culture, technology, economy, you know, work, <laughs> families, intimacy, privacy, whatever you can imagine will change. And the first question is, will, will it be a democratic revolution? <laughs> we, the citizen, the people, the sovereign countries, Europe, do we have a chance to, to say in which world we want to live? So I can elaborate, but I won't. Uh, there is a need of global democracy, so there is a need of global governance. We cannot let three billionaires decide the future of, the, of humanity. As that's the first observation. Everyone knows this, and uh, that's why we have 
tons of initiative. Just me in my portfolio, I'm supposed to go to 17 different uh, <laughs> forums. <laughs> EU, European Council, OECD, UN1, UN2, UN3, UN4, <laughs> uh, NATO, and whatever. So that's a good, partially a good news because the world knows that we have to, to think, to exchange, and to find a way. That's a big danger because if we let a fragmentation of the global AI governance, we will engage a race to the bottom, mm -hmm. if I may. Everyone will... Uh, a kind of global regulatory dumping. Everyone will, every country, every nation, every part of the world will do worse than the other to attract innovation and talents. So there is a real need of a coherent and global conversation and decision. Um, so today that's too fragmented. fragmented. Just to finish, because we, I know that you have tons of questions. I know that we are two speakers and I want to listen to you. Uh, that's in this landscape that we do, that President Macron did convene the Paris AI Action Summit. That's a kind of follow up from Bletchley Park last year. I don't know if you mm -hmm. remember in, in London. But we want to, in a nutshell, to launch a very inclusive conversation. So mm -hmm. we do expect between 60 and 80 head of states. We do open the, the room to 1,500 people, civil society researchers, companies, states, local authorities, lawyers, etc. We will build a, a one-week session because first we have two days of a scientific um, meeting, scientific summit just for researchers. Then we have a weekend of art and culture uh, through AI, with AI, against AI, whatever. And then we have the two days of the summit. So prepare yourself to come in Paris in February See that. 10 and 11. And, and we started briefly, very briefly, this conversation. We concede that it's time to think about the hypothetical existential risk, because of course we have to be sure that AI won't threat humanity itself. That's an important question. But we want also to speak about current concerns, like how to protect intellectual property, what's the future of work, the global problem of energy consumption, the massive problem of uh, the hyper concentration of the power in the hands of very few companies, the need to find solution and maybe infrastructure for the public research. So we want a broader conversation. And, and I finish with this, we want to speak also about the good use of AI because a lesson learned from a, a former very important technical revolution that was the genetically modified organized. You remember mm -hmm. this uh, momentum with a uh, GMO? Mm -hmm. So we did dream about a, a world with uh, plants with vaccines inside or plants growing in the desert or whatever. We didn't even try to do it. Monsanto didn't try to do it. There were no research to, to make the best use of those technologies because the market did prefer the Terminator gene, for example, so sterile seeds to be sure that the farmer will buy every year the same seeds. So if we don't have a positive action to encourage, reward, <laughs> showcase, promote the good uses and the good research, they won't happen. So that's basically what will happen in Paris in February. And we are here to strengthen the conversation right. with our Irish friends <laughs> and, it's and right. European. It's great to have you here doing that. But before turning to you, uh, Patricia, just uh, another word on this, on the conference in February. It's it's pretty big in scale, right? And what sort of people exactly are you trying to attract? Is it experts or is it people involved in the public policy, the citizenry? There is a schedule. So two days of a, a very important scientific summit. Mm -hmm. So they speak between researchers. Two days with everyone, art, culture, journalists, etc. One day open to the multi-stakeholder movement, so NGOs, big tech companies, uh, researchers, uh, and one day within head of states, so that uh, we do expect a lot of different people. I could add that then, if you plan to come in Paris, on 12th and 13th, the UNESCO will organize another summit in Paris too, dedicated to the transformation of government through AI. So that's good. I'll come back to you in a, in, a, in a little while. I have questions now about this summit and what the, the purpose of it is, what its objectives are. But 
I'll put the same question to you, Patricia. Do you have anything to say about the nature of the attempts to coordinate globally around matters of AI? Is there any kind of good, bad or indifferent examples of this that you can talk about? Um, you know, specifically, I think it's early to have examples of it, but we can look back to atomic energy and stuff like that. And people, I think originally we were almost, we, I personally would have held back making those parallels, but I think mm. it actually, you know, you don't want to, you know, you want to be careful and walk the line between fear and awareness. But I think that concept of it having to be global is really important because the first thing that happens, and it's already happened, um, innovation versus regulation. The US is winning because Europe is X, Y, Z, you know, with respect to regulation. Um, we have to do because China and Russia, um, this, and it all centers around this idea of competition. So it's a race to the bottom at that point, right? Um, so without this kind of global agreement that it is not like anything we've seen before. I've worked in the space for 25 years now. Um, you know, the, the internet, digital, you know, there has been, everybody tries to draw the parallels there, but we're, we're attempting to replicate human intelligence so much more than be more, better connected, you know. Um, we're talking about PhD level models now, you know, so you know, take that into account, that, that's happening. So before the, the people like to think about the existential threat is super intelligence when, when we get better. I think there's a lot that can happen before then. Oh, yeah. So people would like, as we were saying earlier, us to, you know, to look further and that's the bit we need to be worried about. But, you know, you don't have to have super intelligence to do harm. You don't have to have to an unintended harm, right? This is this is the issue a little bit, right? A lot of the times it's not that you're always trying to, people are willfully trying to do any, it, it's competition, it's commercial interest as well. Like So we have to, and I think you spoke very well about that, to say that we have to be very careful that we, that it isn't just consolidating the, the power and the wealth among a couple of companies who can control this. Like, so I think there is an awful lot. I think I'm really proud that we're, we led this in Europe. Like I, when this all kicked off, I've been in the space for so long, but the fact that Europe had already had the EU AI Act in, in train was really important for when the LLMs uh, became exploded onto the, the scene into the public consciousness that, you know, that work was ongoing. Even the people who developed it even the people who wrote the paper in 2016 on Transformers, um, nobody expected it to work like this. So we were very lucky to have already thought about the concepts of AI um, in Europe. And then the language modified to incorporate frontier models and LLMs and the fact that models previously were, were narrow and they were experts in a particular area. These models are laterally working their generic their generative but they're general so they work in every the same model can answer questions in a medical field and, and and law we never really had that before and that's important to remember even though there was decades of ai this changed so quickly and we are literally scrambling to catch up and that's really important so the idea is no one country no one region can actually do this successfully alone um, unfortunately i think regulation often follows disaster <laughs> or, mm. or problems or whoever it is who is in charge, it affects them, you know. And, and usually that's when regulation really comes, uh, comes after. I think the EU will be a good example. So at least people can look to regulation that's already been years in development um, in order to be able to get some kind of cohesive global. But I don't think it works very well when you have one region doing it alone, because as we know, these companies are global, all the companies we control. So there are so many positives to be got from this. We just have to be careful that we don't get um, persuaded too much on the, uh, on the idea of uh, innovation trumps regulation or, or regulation stifles innovation. We, mm. we had a company, we built a company with ethical AI. You can do it. It may cost you a little bit more. It may slow you down a tad. It's not impossible. It's just nobody wants to do it. If you're a commercial company, you don't want to do it. Mm. It doesn't mean it's technically not possible. Um, and I don't really believe it stifles innovation that much. You can look to medical field and finance, um, all the, to show highly regulated spaces are hugely innovative. Um, but Indeed, I make two brief comments. I was about to invite you in, please. You did ask us to have a lively yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So first, I totally agree with what you're saying. When you say that it was a bit unexpected, I remember the first time someone told me about ChatGPT. It was like three years ago, more or less. 
And they told me, we don't understand. We, we did develop a tool to summarize a big report, and it happens that they, that they do arithmetics. Mm. But it was not planified. Yeah. It was a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they say, oh, something. We, we did yes. stronger Online. than we thought. On language, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they still don't understand why those models based on statistics and language mm -hmm. are able to do mathematics. They still don't understand this. Yeah, that's the same. <laughs> and the second point, when you said, okay, we can speak a bit about the existential threat, but th there is much more. And I totally agree. Probably we should pay more attention to the diffraction of AI yeah. in everything. And I was thinking, you know, those models, they are designed to be efficient. So you ask a question, they do answer. If they don't know, they invent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they don't invent, they... Hallucinate. Become crazy. Hallucinate. Thank you. Mm. But for example, in the history of humanity, the greatest minds like Socrates, they didn't answer. Mm. They were able to say, are you sure that this is your question? And what do you think? And can you elaborate? And if we build a world where every, each of us, we live constantly with a digital servant mm. <laughs> answering to every question, every time. <laughs> That's a different world, mm -hmm. and maybe not a, a good world for human dignity. For mm -hmm. so, we should also pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. Which kind of society are we designing? Mm -hmm. I'd like to think uh, Socrates would approve of this method of having two experts talk. <laughs> I dream. To each other if to some the... Irish want to do it, I dream about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a Socratish. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you sure? I'm sure. Is there... it really your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But to go back to you, Henri, if I may. Just on the on the summit, which sounds really exciting. Can you describe what the objective of the of the, who is the lead ministry? Is it the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in France? I should have asked. Yes, an international summit is supposed to be led. Would have thought. The, so but we work with three or four ministers. I think what what you say is compelling. Obviously, the AI knows no borders, so mm -hmm. to have a coordinated action to such a problem is mm -hmm. is the only option as opposed to the best option. Mm -hmm. But what is the objective of the ministry? Is it to try to position France as a, a global leader in, senses, in sensible AI, as it is fast becoming? No, we, we are a global leader. Yeah. Sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, clearly, first I want to be, as you said, here we have no choice. That's Europe or nothing. Mm -hmm. If you want to, to have a, a seat on the driver's seat, <laughs> we have to act, to think and to act as European. The, remember, that's a... We have the example. Do you remember five years ago when Spain tried to prototype the copyright directive? They wanted Google News to pay Indeed, yeah. the press. And Google did just boycott Spain. Mm -hmm. And Spain said, please apologize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I suspend my job. Then we had a European directive. And after six months, Google News did pay the press. Yeah. Because we are half of the market. Mm -hmm. So our voice matters mm -hmm. as European. So we want to strengthen a European point of view. And of course, that's a summit. So we are we have five working groups with between 100 and 200 people. Uh, Ireland is part of the group about innovation and, uh, and culture. Um, so that's a collective discussion. Probably we expect at least two deliveries. One, we, we really want to find a solution to have something like a public open infrastructure for research because we cannot ask permission to three billionaires to innovate. Mm -hmm. So we need to be sure that the academics and maybe the small innovators have access to some resources to innovate. Wow. Today, even in Stanford or Berkeley, they are very frightened because of the, the strong monopoly of few uh, very rich yep, concentration of power. So that's a very important question. And regarding the global governance, um, today you know that uh, an enormous civil war between UN agencies, if, you, if we face the truth. Everyone wants to be the leader of mm -hmm. AI governance. So we expect to first to create a consensus regarding the needs of governance and to say, no, this is not just about ethics or risks. This is about energy, cultural and language, linguistic diversity, uh, market regulation uh, to avoid the big monopoly. So first to draw uh, a comprehensive and coherent uh, map of the needs of governance, the topics, the subjects, and then to convince everyone that it's time to build a, a system of governance. So 
not a national approach, but not one central body pretending to do everything. So probably there is a room for the ITU, another for the UNESCO, another for the OECD, and uh, we will try to encourage a peaceful conversation about uh, a good organization. Just keeping it a little closer to home, I'll, I'll put a similar version of the question to you, Patricia, but staying with you, Henri. The division of labor between France and the EU, mm -hmm. so to do this properly, this kind of uh, the cohesive system you've tried to describe, are there things that are obviously done better at the level of the EU, things that are obviously done better at the level of the member states? Contrary to Bletchley Park, the EU is part of the design of the summit from the beginning. They do co-finance. We work with them as we work with the 27. So they are completely on board. But President Macron did convene the summit, but that's a European project. And we do expect China, we do expect Prime Minister Modi, we, we do expect... I don't know for the American administration in February, but <laughs> they were supposed to be there. <laughs> and when you say Bletchley Park, you're referring to the UK government's attempt at a similar yeah. effort last year. Yeah, but it was uh, without Brussels and without uh, half of European countries. Good. Tricia, kind of similar question. Ireland being obviously a small, prosperous, hyper tech savvy country, what kind of role could Ireland play in this discussion about how, how AI should be should be managed and the division again between countries like Ireland and organizations like the EU? Could you describe how the division of labor might best land? Um, it's an interesting one because, you know, at the the core of all AI is data, right? I mean, you know, we talk about the EU AI Act, but what's actually happening a lot of time is mm. uh, the G GDPR is actually almost quite relevant and, and extremely relevant in a lot of the aspects and the controversies around AI because of how the data is gathered. A lot of personally identifiable information. The question is how, how that intersects and overlaps and, and, and affects the existing GDPR rules. Ireland plays a very core role in that mm. because of uh, yeah. the EU headquarters of so many of the big tech companies. Um, you know, and then we have DSA and DMA and, and there then there'll be the regulation of the companies. Again, a lot of them are headquartered here. Um, and how that will affect things going forward. The regulation of the foundation models and, and the bigger stuff is, is Brussels, um, and that makes sense because of the, mm. the, the very wide impact for everybody across the EU and beyond. Um, I think Ireland plays an interesting role, and, and we have a lot of experience working with the big tech companies <laughs> for so many years now because of this. Um, but it you know it it means we've we've have the relationships we have an understanding we're very in the middle of it we're very aligned with Europe on the fact that we're after a, an ethical approach to AI. Um, I think the main issues now going forward are about when we come to the implementation regulation is resourcing, and I think everybody needs to pay attention to the fact that it is going to be a challenge to resource the regulation of of the EU AI Act, of all the things, things are mm. leveling up. The amount of regulation, in the, we have to be careful, and all of us have to be careful, that the regulation doesn't stifle innovation. Not that regulation should, but it can, mm. if it isn't resourced and adequately implemented. Um, and then you, you, you almost provide a good reason for somebody to, to push back um, um, on this. Totally agree. That could be an important role, uh, one of the important roles of uh, Ireland. We need those companies to be part of the solution. We need. Mm -hmm. We cannot just pretend to regulate yeah. them with bureaucrats in Brussels. But that's not easy no. because they have this crazy race to the top, yeah. to what they call the top, <laughs> because they have this. There is a cultural gap, a growing cultural divide. They, they have this. Uh, libertarianism, some yeah. people speak about techno-fascism, <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, they don't understand. They really don't understand what you are doing here. And maybe we don't understand what they are doing there. And of course, you are a perfect interface. You, you are real European, but you, you, you have the headquarters and, and you are the, the gate <laughs> for yeah, them yeah. to Europe. Yeah. So we need them to understand what you are doing. We need Yep. Europe to understand what they are doing. Yep. We need to bridge this divide mm. because one day, soon, maybe in a few years, everyone will say, but the real danger is China and we will stop exchanging with the Valais. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. 
It's interesting what you say, Patricia, because um, I'm not giving anything away to say this, that uh, regulators, civil service, various leaders in Ireland acknowledge that in order to, much of the EU legislation, the EU level legislation, the DMA, the DSA, the AI, the CHIPS Act, etc., a lot of it is sensible, but the sheer bandwidth that it would require for countries like Ireland to meet its obligations mm -hmm. uh, are just really considerable. Yeah. So it's just that idea of yeah. good ideas, but the uh, the ability to actually it's, it's just We just need to move quick. You know, I mean, like we want to be, we are so tech focused here. A lot of our FDI is around tech um, and stuff. It's so important to Ireland. We just need to move quickly. We need to move decisively. I haven't seen anything to say that we're not yeah. yet. Um, but it's very important. There are so many opportunities for, you know, indigenous Irish companies, micro businesses, SMEs, um, as well as mm. the multinationals. I mean, we don't have to just talk about mm. AI in the context of these guys the whole time. Um, Ireland has to move quickly in order to be able to, um, you know, have that place. And mm. whoever is leading, and uh, you know, if we get into leaderboards or not, it the point will be a place that you can do business mm. efficiently. I really do think the regulation, when building a company, their guardrails, yeah. their their guardrails to operate. But it is first. I think that regulation is not always the enemy of innovation. Yeah, agreed. and I say very often in the U.S. that the French gastronomy is heavy regulated <laughs> <laughs> and still a good hey. gastronomy. Yeah. Um, but we need a, a regulation conceived, designed to be a resource. Yeah. And maybe one example that was a bit, uh, I was a bit ashamed as a European. In India, they told me, oh, the principles of your GDPR are, are brilliant. This idea that we should organize the exchange of data through the consent of the user is a, is a beautiful idea. But they told me, why did you build such a burden for your, for your companies? Mm -hmm. And in India, with the same principles, they try to design a consent management system that allows companies to innovate faster because they have ac direct access to the consent. And if I revoke my consent, it's revoked from um, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So they did design an inf a technical infrastructure to share the consent, to implement the same ideas, but in a way that was a resource for innovators. Yeah, sure. I think that the DSA was elegant and smart. Mm -hmm. For me, the AI Act, for example, 415 pages. Yeah, that's yeah. too heavy. That's the, yeah. again the bad way. To, so regulation is not bad, but uh, heavy, uh, mm -hmm. bureaucratic, uh, tatillon. We say in French, mm -hmm. regulation is bad. Yes, agreed, agreed. And so it's how we do it, right? We need to find yeah. smart regulation. Yeah, we are hosting a, an event in Brussels with one of our peer think tanks, CEPs, uh, mm -hmm. the Centre for European Policy Studies, with a network of eight think tanks the IIA has brought together from uh, across the European Union. And we're talking about better regulation mm -hmm. in the field of tech on Wednesday. And this is exactly what you were just saying. Um, about... We say it this morning with the ambassador, the treaty that did establish the Suez Canal was seven pages. Huh. Mm -hmm. The treaty that did establish Eurotunnel, 7,000 pages. Mm -hmm. wow. And it did stand six months? Or six <laughs> I don't remember. Euro Eurotunnel. You remember then they did, uh, <laughs> they did collapse. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so you can make, you mm -hmm. can build a straight canal with seven pages. You don't need 7,000 pages. So it's, a, it's uh, the the elegance of it, as you put it, which is very French, if you don't mind my saying, <laughs> talking about elegance and public policy making. It's a real thing. I have one more question for you. I have lots of topics I'd like to draw on, but I have one question, then I'm going to throw it open to you guys in case anyone has anything to say. And Ireland's France. France is Ireland's closest EU, EU neighbour, as we often say now. So two mm -hmm. countries very, very close and share so much of our worldview. But one area where there is potentially a, a difference pertains to the role of the state in promoting activities amongst Indigenous industries. And I'm wondering if you have a view on Rion state aid and the role that the state should play uh, in, in a reimagined EU in terms of promoting innovation, especially around AI. What, what role do you think the state should play or could play? Yeah, that's a heavy question. But yes, everyone has to remember that I think that in France, the state did create the nation. The state was first. That's a very long story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Louis XIV was there before the that's national <laughs> feeling. But anyway, uh, so I deeply believe that 
even if we are very specific, uh, the, the relation between France, the French nation and state is very, very close. Uh, in Europe, we have states, real states, real administrations <laughs> with basically a certain a pretty good level of um, digital public services. So that's an asset and we have to consider it as an asset. So for example, I try to encourage in Brussels the, the rise of a kind of uh, EU stack. We should build a kind of open, open source public infrastructure for ID, payment, etc. Because of course, if you do build your economy within foreign platforms, you will be like a Uber driver. <laughs> they will decide your revenue and you won't be free, never. And you won't be rich, never. <laughs> so that's my view, but maybe you have different views, I don't know. Big question, Patricia. It's not squarely in your area of expertise, but you've anything to say about what role the state, the Irish state specifically, should play in promoting innovation? Um, I think in my experience across uh, the last couple of decades, you know, I've worked, worked a lot with US companies and here in Europe, Europe is risk adverse when it comes to investing in innovation. And across Europe, I think Ireland, I know very well the Irish scene, but I do know the European scene. Horizon 2020, the EIC program was conceived of in order to try and address the lack of investment in innovation. Mm -hmm. So we can decry, you know, the US versus EU, but the fact is, you know, Mistral was, you know, fantastic that you guys did that investment. But prior to that, across Europe, um, the US will beat us every time on that because they will take those big, bigger gambles. They're not looking for a purchase order before they <laughs> give you investment. And to be frank, a lot of investors still uh, look for that. We don't take the risk. We are not, dare I say, incentivized enough to take the risks. I think there's been lots of policies and programs to try and encourage investment, be it VCs or angels, to take more uh, deep tech risks, but it happens in med tech, it happens in biotech, it does not happen in technology. I know we're talking about all these investments in AI, but they're new, right? They're new since the LLMs, everybody's woken yeah, up to them. The, of the CAC 40, you know, the 40 biggest companies in the stock market, the average age is 125 years okay. in France. Mm -hmm. So that's the fifth generation. So they don't have any entrepreneur anymore mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. to run the company. They it's a, are... And it's different, right? I mean, the, how you break it down, how you look at investment, how you look at the ROI is different for deep tech. And AI falls squarely in deep tech. Mm -hmm. It's ICT, but it needs more investment before you see the returns. It needs patient capital. And the EU still struggles with this. Yeah. And you know what they do? That We layer on a but lot of bureaucracy. The hand, for example, uh, one weakness of the US is that they don't have infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They don't even have a, an ID. They cannot organize proper elections <laughs> <laughs> because they don't care about mm -hmm. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that's... A... Yeah, and it, it, it's a different... I think we in the EU have to look at, you know, we keep talking about how we can compete in AI and tech and our own indigenous companies without relying on the consolidation of power that's happened. Um, it's not too late, but I definitely think we have a lot of work to do to catch up, but it has to take a, a lot of will to be able to recognise the, the failings of EU when it comes to investment in innovation. So we could talk about the details of state mm. aid. I think I think we need to revisit it across mm. the board about we are we are crippling ourselves when it comes to innovation mm. by not taking those risks. Very far. And I don't know if I completely share this view, but a friend of mine told me so, so yesterday, <laughs> In the US, the idea that they need to be a digital superpower is a collective project. Mm. They, nobody will contest this. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we are a bit hedonist. <laughs> <laughs> we want a good life, good wine, yeah, good yeah, yeah. True, true, true. <laughs> human dignity, uh, holidays. Maybe something not, in the middle. Right? Why yeah. not? Yeah. Probably we have better lives. But yeah. if we don't decide together that we need power, that this has to be a, a real project for Europe yeah. mm. will be out of the story. Yeah, I agree. I think um, human dignity and holidays isn't too much of an indulgence, you know. <laughs> that's, uh...